In this video, we're going to learn how to model trend in seasonality in a time series. The time series we'll use will be airline miles traveled in the United States. Okay, and we're going to start looking at it from 2003 through 2012. So, first thing we should do is probably create a moving average trend curve, which we've discussed in previous lessons. And basically, a 12 month moving average with monthly data basically will smooth out basically the month-to-month -month variation and eliminate seasonality because you'll have one month from each month of the year. So then we can sort of see what's going on. So select these two columns which have our month number and our actual airline miles and then we'll do this type of scatter graph. So you can see every 12 months there seem to be these two months of peaks. Those are July and August as we'll see later. Okay. So if we want to understand what's going on with the trend, we really need to smooth this out, eliminate seasonality. So go right click, add trend line, okay, mo moving average, and I'll do 12 months there. And that should work. And you can see that dotted line, it's not really that visible, but you can see we go up pretty much the trend and then there's a slight dip and then we go back up. But basically that smooths out the variation, but we do see the seasonality here. There's a definite pattern every 12 months, basically the peaks repeat and the valleys repeat. And so the question is, how can we model a trend? Well, there's two ways, additive trend model and multiplicative trend model. It's not clear which one is better, but whichever one fits the data better is probably the one you should use. So let's look at airline miles July 2009 through April 2012. Okay, this is in billions of miles traveled each month. Okay. And so basically, if we want to do an additive model, we take a base level at the beginning and then we'll, which solver we'll have to solve for, okay. And basically, that would be in B2 in this case. And then we'd have a trend per month, which we'll see is 0.5 billion or per month, or 0.6 billion per month, 0.06 billion per month, or 0.72 billion per year. And that get multiplied by the month number, which goes chronologically one through whatever the number of months we have, in this case, 34. Now, the month column here is the month of the year. That's going to be July. That's going to be August, not September, etc. That only goes 1 through 12. And so what would be the forecast equation? We would take the base level plus the trend times the month number. If the trend were 2 million a month, 5 months from now, we'd add 10 million to the base. If the trend were 2 million a month, 6 months from now, we'd add 12 million, etc. And then we would look up the seasonality. Okay with a simple V lookup. And the season alley should average to zero. So in other words, some months will be above average, some months will be below average in an added model. Okay, so what would be the forecast equation? Well, the key is to this formula. We start with the base level for the added model. We've named this plus the trend model, a trend per month times the number of months in the future, and then we would look up the seasonality. It's a V lookup true based on the 1 through 12 in this range, and that's our forecast. We find our error, actual minus predicted, we take our squared error, we want to minimize the sum of squared errors. Now these happen to be the right numbers, but we can change them, and the average of the seasonal indices will be equal to zero. Okay, so we'll fill in these two columns, the uh, cells, the R squared and the standard deviation of the errors in a minute. So now if we run the solver, okay, what should it look like? We should minimize the sum of squared errors. We should change basically the trend per period and the base, that's B2 through B3, and the monthly seasonalities, they average to zero. It's nonlinear due to squared errors. We don't need the multi-start. It's an additive forecasting model. We're just adding together parameters. Regular GRG will work fine with that. So let me see if I can change some things here. If I assume there's no seasonality, what would happen? I'd probably get a worse sum of squared errors. And if I assume, let's say, there's no trend. Okay. So now if I would just run this thing, and we have to allow things to be negative. Okay, so the average is zero. So I'd run this thing. Okay. And basically, I find out July and August are the busiest. July averages about 6 billion more than an average month. August, 4 billion more. The least busy month, January and February, we have no money and the weather is cold. The trend's about 0 0.06 per month, which is about 0.7 billion per year. And we start with a base level of 37.37. Now, how accurate are we? We could look at the standard deviation of the errors. OK, 
okay, about 0.38. And then the R squared, what percentage of the variation in the actual is explained by the forecast? There's the actual. And then the forecast is there. So we explain 98.9% of the variation, and then the standard deviation of the errors is 0.39. Okay, so we'll compare that with the multiplicative model, which is coming up right now. Okay, so the multiplicative model, we got the same data, but the forecast is different. We take a base level and we assume the trend is like a percentage, like a trend equals 1.02 miles increase 2% per month. A trend equals 0.95 miles decrease 5% per month. And usually this is going to work out better because things work in percentages in the real world. Okay. So we take a base level times the trend raised to the power of the month number. Again, that goes 1 through, in this case, 34. And then we multiply by the seasonality, the seasonal index. So in other words, for uh, August, for July, we'll see... The seasonal index is 1.16, which means July is 16% above an average month, and February is a shorter month. That's one reason it's going to have a low seasonal index, 0.83. That would mean that basically we see 17% less miles traveled in February than an average month. This is after adjusting for trend. So the key, again, will be the forecast equation, which implements what we have here. Okay, so we take the base level, which will be what we name to be this cell, times the trend raised with a carry key to the month number 1 through 34. Then we do a vertical lookup based on the month of the year in the seasonal column. And the average of the seasonality should be 1 here. Okay, so now let's change the numbers. Let's suppose the trend, uh, the base is 50, there's no trend, and all the seasonal indices are 1 which would not be right. Okay, now here we need the multi-start because we've got a pretty complicated multiplicative model raising things to powers. So we need bounds on the changing cells. So we need the squared error first. Okay, so we'll minimize the sum of the squared errors. We'll see whichever is forecast model additive or multiplicative is better on that. So we've got really a bad sum of squared errors because here we got 4.92. We can fix that though. Okay, so now what we're going to do is minimize the sum of the squared errors. Okay, that's right there. Okay, we're going to change the base, the trend, and the seasonal indices. The average of the seasonal indices will be 1. We need bounds, so we'll say all the seasonal indices are less than or equal to 3. Okay, they'll be greater than or equal to 0. The base will be less than or equal to 100. These numbers just don't get to 100. And the trend per month has got to be less than 2. We'd never bump up against the bounds. But we need the multi here. I mean, because we've got a really complicated model. We've got bounds on the changing cells. So if I let this go, it should work. Okay, so it's working. And we'll hit escape on this in a second when it's done. So we'll let it run until it thinks it's fat run its course here. Okay, solve or converge to a global solution. Okay, now the sum of squared errors is a bit worse, 5.59. So this model is not as good. Usually multiplicative works better. But what's the R squared? So the R squared would be between the actual and our forecast for this model. Okay, 0.987. See, that's a little bit worse than 0.989. Now, the standard error is most important because 95% of your forecasts are accurate within two standard errors. Let's move this up here. So the standard deviation of the errors, the error and squared error column are exactly like they were before. I should have mentioned that, is 0.41. And that's a little bit worse. So the additive model is better. But again, how would I forecast, let's say, the next month if it was month, okay, it would be month 35 and it would be May. 
Okay, if I was going to use this model, I would just drag down the forecast equation and I get the forecast. And the additive model, if I wanted to forecast the next month, I'd take 35 there, okay, and that would be May. And then if I would drag down the forecast equation, I'd get a forecast of 40.72. Here it's 40.74, not much different. But that's a really good introduction, I think, to isolating trend in seasonality in time series. And if you were a Wall Street analyst, this would be critical. Like when you want to predict quarterly revenue or quarterly earnings, you need to understand the seasonality, that Amazon will have a bigger quarterly earnings in the fourth quarter than they will in the first quarter, even though the first quarter is later chronologically.